All right, we're, we are continuing our look at Paradise Lost. We're going to look at book four today. Uh, I wanted to begin that, though, with a slight backtracking to look at uh, the encounter between Uriel and uh, Satan at the end of book three. <coughs> because Satan, if you recall, back when we left him in book two, was working his way up from hell, having uh, gained uh, exit, I guess, through the gates of hell by God's permission, and uh, is trying to find his way to paradise where he has heard the prophecy about Adam and Eve who had as yet been uh, uncreated, and he's going to see if he can, uh, by fraud, deceive them. <clears throat> and God predicts the outcome of this deception, namely that mankind would fall, pronounces judgment, the son, uh, he declares grace to mankind, and the son offers himself as the means of that grace for which he's praised. And there's then, uh, it's, it's chock full of theological discussion about uh, the, uh, the reception of that grace by mankind subsequently, etc. Um, I'm going to skip over uh, much of that and just pick it up at the, towards the end of uh, book three. As I say, when uh, Satan is now, this is the prelude to book four where Satan does uh, meet Adam and Eve for the first time, or Eve at any rate, um, and he encounters Uriel, Uriel, one of the uh, archangels, and uh, he needs directions. He has no idea how to get there. And so he presents himself as a lesser angel to a uh, greater angel. Uh, so he, he effectively butters Uriel up with, with uh, praise, etc. But let me uh, pick it up in line 654. Uh, I'll just read this and, um, and then make a brief comment. So this is Satan addressing him. Uriel, for thou of those seven spirits that stand in sight of God's high throne, gloriously bright, the first art wont his great authentic will interpreter through high heaven to bring. Just a comment here. Um, the chariot mentioned uh, here um, uh, in Song, or rather in Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 3, book 9, is a type of the new covenant, uh, and the angels form its parts. And there's a, the word for chariot is uh, argamam, A-R-G-A-M-A-M, A-N rather, and that's an acronym of the archangels' names that form the chariot, and there are seven of them. The R is for Raphael, G for Gabriel, M for Michael, uh, etc. Um, and Uriel is the first uh, a good angel that we encounter in Paradise Lost. And a significant one. We'll find the significance of him in Book 5 as well, when he uh, is first to stand against Satan's deceptions. But that's a, that's a backtracking when that happens. So at the moment, there's a chronology, and because we're beginning in medias res, in the middle of things, and then in book five, we uh, get the uh, recounting of the war in heaven and the division of the angels and the, their casting down, which we start off with in book one. But here, Uriel, for thou of those seven spirits, probably the seven spirits, um, maybe the seven spirits in the seven churches, not exactly sure, but the seven spirits that stand inside of God's high throne, gloriously bright. The first art won't his great authentic will, interpreter through highest heaven to bring, where all his sons thy embassy attend. And here art likeliest by supreme decree, like honor to obtain. And as his eye to visit off this new creation round, unspeakable desire to see and know all these his wondrous works, but chiefly man his chief delight and favor, him for whom all these his works so wondrous he ordained, hath brought me from the choirs of cherubim alone thus wandering. Brightest seraph, tell in which all, in which of all these shining orbs hath man his fixed seat, or fixed seat hath none, but all these shining orbs his choice to dwell that I may find him and with secret gaze or open admiration him behold on whom the great creator hath bestowed worlds and on whom hath all these graces poured 
that both in him and all things, as is meet, the universal maker we may praise, who justly hath driven out his rebel foes to deepest hell, and to repair that loss, created this new happy race of men to serve him better. Wise are all his ways. So spake, Milton's comment, so spake the false dissembler unperceived. For neither man nor angel can discern hypocrisy. Interesting comment. The only evil that walks invisible, except to God alone, by his permissive will, through heaven and earth, and oft, through wisdom wake, sus suspicion sleeps at wisdom's gate, and to simplicity resigns her charge, while goodness thinks no ill where no ill seems, which now for once beguiled, beguiled Uriel, though regent of the sun, and held the sharpest sighted spirit of all in heaven, who to the fraudulent impostor foul in his uprightness answer thus returned. And I'll get to the answer in a second here. But Uriel is the archangel connected to the sun. There are other angels, uh, as we, you'll, if you've read uh, Milton's or Milton C.S. Lewis's sci-fi trilogy that are connected to other of the seven planets. But Uriel is the one connected to the sun and uh, as such the most clear-sighted of all in accordance with the, the brightness of the sun. But he cannot perceive hypocrisy in spite of that. God alone can see that. But he responds, Fair angel, thy desire which tends to know the works of God, thereby to glorify the great workmaster, leads to no excess that reaches blame, but rather merits praise, the more it seems excess, that led thee hither from, from thy imperial mansion thus alone, to witness with thine eyes what some perhaps contented with report here only in heaven. For wonder, wonderful indeed are all his works, pleasant to know and worthiest to be all had in remembrance, always with delight. But what created mind can comprehend their number or the wisdom infinite that brought them forth, etc., etc. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, but then Satan at the conclusion of his speech bows low, 736. He bows down to Uriel uh, in submission, or at least the sign of submission as an inferior angel to, a, to an archangel. Um, Lewis, uh, in his commentary on this and preface to Paradise Lost, noticed the, the gradual deterioration of Satan, which uh, the, the whole epic marks. So he began as uh, Lucifer, an archangel, uh, then became... Uh, uh, a king or a claim king in hell we're about to see he, he becomes a lounge lizard in book 4 of Paradise Lost uh, event, and a peeping tom at that looking in uh, and eventually he will be turned into a serpent he'll not only be in the guise of a serpent he'll be transformed into a serpent crawling on his belly the rest of his days so there's, a, there, there's not just, um, uh, and this is, uh, emphasizes Milton's theme that Satan, the, the punishment that he merits uh, is, is visited upon him. He's becoming progressively worse as time goes by. So it's, he's not just stuck in hell and he's going to be tormented eternally there. He's going to seek to defy God as he seeks to do so. He, all he does is actually degrade himself yet further. So he is losing the goodness of his being in the process, and that, that, that process that I just described is Milton's way of describing the privation of his being. Yes? So the depictions of Milton in other writings, he is really, in other, geez, uh, Satan in other writings, uh, he's really, really ugly, but in Paradise Lost, he starts out <coughs> as beautiful and then gets uglier. So is that like a symbolic inner reflection of how Satan is like really awful and he loses that beauty the further and further he gets from God? It's a theologizing, and it, I mean, there's historical context. I mean, the devil's not portrayed that often in literature. In Dr. Faustus, he's Mephistopheles, right? He's a character and a fixed one. But we don't really see character development there, as it were. Whereas here, we see the development of Satan, as well as the development of Adam and Eve, and as well as the development of God's providence. So there's a, 
uh, an element of history in this, even of the figure of, of Satan. He's not a static figure in that sense. He becomes more tormented. He becomes, he still is potent, but his, he, he is uh, he's steadily humiliated by God. So the more tormented Satan becomes, the uglier he gets. Is that like a connection? It, it, to some degree, although he's always able to present himself as an angel of light as he does here, right? <coughs> so it's almost comic on, on Milton's part, you know, for all his pretensions of being uh, no less but the archangel ruined, uh, and all he's done is lost some of his luster. Uh, it's got it's a lot worse than that. In the end, in order to complete his deception, he's going to have he's going to have to uh, invest uh, the house of a beast to do his temptation. He's not going to be able to present himself as an angel. He's going to have to appear like an animal. So there's a degradation there, and then in the punishment for that is he then is turned into a snake, and he can't go back out of it. And he goes down to the to the other devils to tell of his victory, and they all hiss in response and are all turned into serpents. Eating ashes, furthermore, the fruit that was sweet in their mouths is turned into ashes. So... Uh, that's the beginning or the conclusion of book three. I just wanted to uh, begin with that because book four moves to a different uh, scene and it's that of, uh, the, of Eden for the first time. So uh, the realm of the earth and, and Satan landing on it. And then when he does so, we witness the truth of his claim back in book one that the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven that's his claim doesn't matter as long as i am the same and all that i should be no less than him whom thunder hath made greater that was his vaunting now we're going to find that in eden he is not even in control of himself there's an inner turmoil a psychological torment which mirrors the hell within him and, and Milton will explicitly talk about this so there's a really interesting use of hell as a as a, a location as a place uh, of um, theological distance from God but also as a psychological type of distress it's like the hell inside him kind of thing and it's the hell inside him is a mirror of the hell outside of him so he's not denying that it's not just a psychological reality it's a real place but there's also the, the hell within him is worse than the hell outside of him. And he can't leave it, actually. And the mind is not its own place. And he hasn't, there is no place that God is not uh, sovereign, including over the mind of Satan. All of his thoughts are known to God. We've already seen that in book three. So again, all of his claims, if they are, uh, if he is the father of lies, uh, as scripture says, uh, does he even believe his own lies? Certainly death and sin don't believe him. When, when they encounter him, they're not going to buy that you know, half the spirits of heaven followed you as Satan claims. It was a third. You know, they're pretty accurate. There's no fake news coming from their mouths. But they, it's always fake news coming from his mouth. The only question is whether Satan himself believes his own press. And here we have uh, evidence that it, he's aware that it is just lies. So for, I'll, I'll get to this. But Milton begins it uh, appropriately, given the landing of Satan on the earth, with a cry of warning. Oh, for that warning voice which he who saw the apocalypse, John, heard cry in heaven aloud, then when the dragon, put to second route, came furious down to be revenged on men. What was the first route? When he was cast down from heaven. What's the second route? The cross. Came furious down to be revenged on men. He cannot, uh, he has, God has been crucified and that was the means of his victory. Who's left then? No one but the human beings whom Christ has redeemed. The church. As I say, Revelation 12 is a, is a, good synopsis of the narrative here. 
came came furious down to be revenged on men. Woe to the inhabitants on earth, that now, while time was, our first parents had been warned the coming of their secret foe, and scaped, happily so scaped, his mortal snare. For now, Satan, now first inflamed with rage, came down, the tempter ere the accuser of mankind. He's got nothing to accuse them of yet. To wreak on innocent frail man his loss of that first battle and his flight to hell, yet not rejoicing in his speed, though bold, far off, and fearless, nor with cause to boast, begins his dire attempt, which nigh the birth now ro rolling boils in his tumultuous breast and like a devilish engine back recoils upon himself. He's With the reference to an engine here, he's thinking of a cannon when it fires, it shoots the cannonball and it recoils back on himself. So each time he's trying to uh, assault someone, it, he himself suffers most. Uh, Milton's reflecting on the thing that um, even the pagans acknowledge. Uh, Plato, the, the person who commits a, um, an immoral act, suffers more than the person against whom it's committed. He harms his own soul. So they're, they're, it recoils upon himself, all these attempts. Horror and doubt distract his troubled thoughts, and from the bottom stir the hell within him. And here's the comment. For within him hell he brings, and round about him, nor from hell one step no more than from himself can fly by change of place. Now conscience wakes despair that slumbered, wakes the bitter memory of what he was, what is and what must be worse. Look, the, the enjambment's terrific there. Of worse deeds, worse sufferings must ensue. He knows this. He can't help himself. Sometimes towards Eden, which now in his view lay pleasant, his grieved look he fixes sad. Sometimes towards heaven in the full blazing sun, which now sat high in his meridian tower, then much revolving thus in size began. O thou that with surpassing glory crowned, lookst from thy sole dominion like the God of this new world. He's addressing the sun. Now remember the, the book three began with a uh, meditation on light. Now he sees a, a pale image of that, the sun. At whose sight all the stars hide their diminished heads. To thee I call, but with no friendly voice. And add thy name, O son, to tell thee how I hate thy beams that bring to my remembrance from what state I fell. How glorious once above thy sphere, till pride and worse ambition threw me down. Warring in heaven against heaven's matchless king. And now the moment of regret and remorse and candor, quite frankly. Ah, wherefore? He deserved no such return from me, whom he created what I was in that bright eminence, and with his good upbraided none. Nor was his service hard. What could be less than to afford him praise, the easiest recompense, and pay him thanks? How do? And then the thought turns again. And there's almost a, a Gollum Smeagol thing here. It, it only lasts for a minute because... Uh, we rarely get moments of candor from Lucifer. He's quickly snuffed out by Satan. How do? And, that, and now the anger boils up again. Yet all his good proved ill in me and wrought but malice. Lifted up so high, I stained subjection. I disdained subjection and thought one step higher would set me highest and in a moment quit the debt immense of endless gratitude, so burdensome, so still paying, still to owe, forgetful what from him I still received, and understood not that a grateful mind by owing owes not, but still pays, at once indebted and discharged. What burden then? Oh, had his powerful destiny ordained me some inferior angel, I had stood then happy, no unbounded hope had raised ambition. So he's blaming. I wish I had not been as I was, then I wouldn't have done this. 
If I had not been Lucifer and I'd been a lesser angel, maybe I wouldn't have fallen prey to my pride. Yet, why not? Some other power as great might have aspired, and me, though mean, drawn to his part. It would still be possible. And then again, but other powers as great fell not. Uriel, Michael, Gabriel. But stand unshaken, from within or from without, to all temptations armed. Now he asks himself, hadst thou the same free will and power to stand? Thou hadst. Whom hast thou then, or what to accuse? But heaven's free love dealt equally to all. Be then his love accursed, since love or hate, to me alike, it deals eternal woe. Nay, cursed be thou, since against his thy will chose freely what it now so justly rues. Me miserable, which way shall I fly? Infinite wrath and infinite despair. Which way I fly is hell. Myself am hell. And in the lowest deep, a lower deep still threatening to devour me opens wide. To which the hell I suffer seems a heaven. Oh, then at last relent. Is there no place left for repentance? None for pardon left? None left but submission. And that word disdain forbids me and my dread of shame among the other spirits beneath whom I seduced with other promises and other vaunts than to submit, boasting I could subdue the omnipotent, I, me. They little know how dearly I abide that boast so vain under what torments inwardly I groan, while they adore me on the throne of hell with diadem and scepter high advanced. The lower still I fall, only supreme in misery. Such joy ambition finds. But say I could repent and could obtain by act of grace my former state. How soon would height recall high thoughts? How soon unsay that what feigned submission swore? Ease would recant vows made in pain as violent and void. For never can true reconcilement grow where wounds of deadly hate have pierced so deep. Which would but lead me to a worse relapse and heavier fall so should I purchase dear short intermission bought with double smart. This knows my punisher. Therefore, as far from granting he as I from begging peace, all hope excluded thus, behold, instead of us outcast, exiled, his new delight mankind created, and for him this world. So farewell, hope, and with hope, farewell, fear, farewell, remorse, all good to me is lost, and then the famous line, evil, be thou my good. By thee at least divided empire with heaven's king I hold by thee, and more than half perhaps will reign, as man ere long, and this new world shall know. <coughs> uh, it's a continuation of the theological reflections that are in book three, it seems to me. What choices could I have here? Let, let me consider this side of it. Well, what if I did repent? That wouldn't work. What if I were, if only I weren't placed as high in heaven as I were, then I wouldn't have been tempted by that. But there are others that were equally high as placed. And even if I weren't, I would have been perhaps seduced by somebody who was higher than me, as a, like an archangel and I were a lesser angel, so that wouldn't work either. But what if I, so all of these possibilities open to him, but actually they're none, none of them are real. But again, it's, it's, it's um, f for the readership thinking through the psychological state of a being without hope and yet desperately trying to, trying to find a way through it. Demonstrating the torment of Satan and in the end claiming, evil be thou my good. Now, <laughs> I've said Milton's portrait of evil is orthodox insofar as he presents good as, as uh, everything created is good, and evil is the privation of good, it's the absence of good. If Satan is devoted to oppose God, that means that evil will be his good, but evil is nothing, in which case he is going to become more and more non-existent. He's gonna lose the goodness of his being. 
and as I say that we can see that in the descent from archangel to king to lounge lizard toad to little inch you know as I say peeping tom to snake there's this degeneration uh, that Milton portrays yes Yes, but he, again, he, he's deceiving himself somewhat there because, again, back in book three, uh, the God says that because he was the author of his own temptation and fall, he will have no pardon. So it's not an avenue open to him. This is, this is speculation on his part that he might receive re uh, forgiveness for his transgression. And, uh, I mean, however you want to see it. He won't do it, or he can't do it. Can't he do it because he won't do it, or won't he do it because he can't? I don't know. I mean, the, the, the conjunction of Satan's will to never desire the thing that he can't have can be matched by God's unwillingness to show forgiveness to a creature who uh, abandoned him for no reason whatsoever, as Satan himself confesses here. Like, no reason whatsoever, other than that he, want, he wanted to deny God what he was owed out of sheer thanks for his grace. Uh, and Milton matches them up quite well, but he wants to demonstrate, and I think this is, this is important, that even if God has um, determined that it is so for Satan, the importance of free will in, in loving God rightly, he really makes that a strong emphasis in Paradise Lost, for which reason some people think that Milton's not very Calvinist. I don't happen to agree. I just think he balances it well. And the exercise of Christian faith must be voluntary. Because love is a, is a voluntary act. Uh, but Milton, again, if you want the uh, discussion of that, go back to book three where he, he does do that uh, at some length. So I'll pick it up here in a minute, just a, a few comments and comments about what's happened thus far and how Milton is then going to further this in the fourth book where we, we've shifted, as I said, in the first two books in hell, in the third book in heaven, in the fourth book uh, on earth, the earthly paradise, and then in books five and six we're going to shift back uh, to heaven and a war in heaven and then we will return to the earthly realm thereafter with occasional uh, interjections from God. But there's a little bit of back and forth there. Okay, three things that have happened so far. Uh, in the very first passages, Milton has employed epic conventions very strongly and very distinctly. In fact, they are so exaggerated in their exactness that the reader is forced to examine the, the epic and the nature of heroism itself. That is the consequence of Milton's uh, clinging very exactly to epic conventions. It's not so exact in Dante. It's not so exact in Beowulf. Tolkien argues that Beowulf is, is an epic. I think he's, there's, there's merit in the case. Dante certainly thinks that his work is an epic. But he doesn't cling to the convention so precisely as Milton does. Milton does it very precisely, and he does so because he wants to say something about what his epic is in relation to that epic, and what his heroism is in relation to that heroism, and he wants to say it is night and day. It's categorically distinct. And we will know that by comparison. That's the only way you can see things distinctly. So uh, there's, a, there's a novelty to Milton's epic, and yet the novelty can't be seen on its own. It has to be seen by what came before it. And the what came before it is the way the world views heroism, whereas what Milton is going to present as heroism is what the world cannot see and does not acknowledge, which is that uh, it's, it's a stumbling block block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, and yet it is Christ and his gospel. So that's the reason. So the three things, the exaggerated epic conventions, 
and with it, the, the heroism and the nature of heroism are being, uh, there's a spotlight on those things. You, you can't miss it. Secondly, the re reader has been attuned to what he calls answerable style. He'll, talk, he'll use this phrase at a few points in his writing. It, he uses it again in Book 9 of Paradise Lost. Um, by the end of the Consul in Hell, so the end of, or the beginning of Book 2, uh, we, we now question the words and the symbols and the gestures as they occur. We don't take them at face value. The Romantics, as I say, did, which I think just makes them bad readers. We cannot see Milton, Satan, and his suffering angels as heroic in any sense, other than uh, by, by insinuating that everything epic and heroic by worldly standards are, is not what Milton means, and that's intentional. So he, he is he is attuning us to answerable selves. It's a very, it's a type of reader that he is assuming. And he's also fostering when we read this. It's making us read the way he wants us to read. It's pushing us to do that. And so thirdly, there's an irony here. He's subverting the text. Uh, Erasmus does this, Thomas More does this. Um, there's a rhetorical irony that divides the audience of those who understand what he is saying and, and those who won't understand what he's saying. So the great irony of the romantic reading of Paradise Lost is that actually they're of the devil's party. And they think he must be as well because they are. By the way, both parties, even, even the, those that misread the epic, are getting something from it. They may still appreciate and think it's a great work, and the Romantics did think it was a great work. No doubt about it, but they misread what Milton was doing. Heavy, heavy irony in Milton's portrait here. He says, Satan says one thing, the reader understands another. So these three things, so the exaggerated epic conventions, the attuning the reader to answerable style, and finally, this way of reading the text ironically. That's now we've become attuned to that. So when Satan speaks, we are now reading uh, a subtext. Milton doesn't expect us to be persuaded. This is why I disagree with Stanley Fish's Surprised by Sin. He thinks that the reader is persuaded by Satan and thereby is brought to question as sort of an apologetic inten uh, uh, intention. We are seduced by Satan's argument to the point where we're brought to fall just like Eve is and then we cry out for redemption as it were. I think this is wholly improbable for Milton as a Christian to present this to his audience but I also think that's not actually the way the text works. But it's a really interesting argument by the way by a very prominent American critic, Stanley Fish. Yes? So are you saying that when the text must be read ironically, does it mean that any time you read Satan, you need to take it with a grain of salt? And always. Do you focus not to be deceived? We realize that he is the father of lies and he's always seducing, yes. So that's why it has to be convincing, but you also have to recognize that it's Satan saying that. Yeah, so it's a, tough, it's a tough task on Milton's part. On the one hand, we're not to be persuaded because he's Satan. On the other hand, if, if he's going to be Satan, he has to be persuasive. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a very good portrait of Satan because Satan is a deceiver. Well, what is he? How, how would that work on us then? How could he possibly deceive us? He plays on our sinful nature. We want to be great. The whole epic tradition is about greatness, great men. Aeneas, even if he's pious Aeneas. Uh, Achilles, the great Achilles, the wise and wily Odysseus. These are great men. Milton's heroism is not of greatness. It's of humility. It's the antithesis to uh, heroism as it's been established thus far. Can you argue, though, that the author of the Aeneid, I think they break up with Senator. 
It is Virgil. Um, the Theophany Aeneas. Couldn't you argue that he's being a bit ironic because I mean, very much he's so. described as like a really cool guy, but then he also is not very. He doesn't do things that are really good. You wouldn't say like, oh, that's a good thing that he did when he ditched Dido <coughs> and things like that. I don't think it's ironic, actually, the portrait of Virgil in the Aeneid. But I do think that it is very um, ambiguous, and um, he's a hard hero to sympathize with. And he fails repeatedly. Like as the, as the model, so Virgil's a Stoic. His, her, his hero, he would like to be Stoic and committed to duty in the same way Virgil is. And to some degree he is. He does do what he has been tasked to do. He does land in Italy and establish the beginnings of the Roman Empire. And he has to leave uh, the woman he loves to do so. But he does so uh, through his carnal self, he gives in to uh, his rage and so forth. So his, his enemy, Turnus, on the ground begging for his life at the end of it, he's, he runs his spear through him. That's how it ends. Like, you, if you want to present a hero, you don't have him killing somebody begging for mercy at the end is the last act of the epic, the last lines. I think it's a problem. Augustus, well, he know? didn't know he was his friend. I thought he didn't like him. No, I, well, I mean. He wanted to write an epic glorifying Rome, but then Caesar Augustus was writing, writing an epic about me. Yes, and he wants to write about it, so that it's just that he, it, there is an irony insofar as he thinks that the Roman Empire and the Pax Romana of Augustus Caesar is not a, a true peace. And it's, in, it, but it can't be achieved by force of arms. So there is an ironic but I just don't think it's meant to be read ironically. Every time he speaks, we understand something different. Okay, it's so more that he's doing it differently in the sense that correct. Satan has to be convincing enough that you can believe he's the father of lies, but at the same time, in that sense, you have to take with a grain of salt. Otherwise always, you'll be the always. Okay. So yes. Like a different kind of. Correct. Okay. And that is irony. Yeah. So the speaker says this. He may even think this, but the audience knows better. He's assuming, a Christian re he's assuming a Christian readership. He is not assuming uh, a, a, a North American audience who's totally ignorant of the account of Paradise Lost. So in that sense, do we have dramatic irony because we already know that Paul's going to happen? Yes, of course. Although, uh, really, it's not, it's not, I mean, it's, dramatic irony is just simply what happens in the drama by the characters. It's, I mean, we, we know the plot already. I mean, it, it's been given away in the first few lines of the epic anyway. Do you think that's intentionally used or just a consequence that we already know? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if Milton's like playing off of that because we already know. So like, kind of, we could be sitting back screaming like, "Don't fall for it! You've got to know this, but you can't know this." And Milton do, and Milton himself does at various points. He cries out, "Don't, don't, don't do it!" Yeah. Well, again, that's Virgil does the same, and so does Homer. When something horrible is about to happen, he interjects on behalf of the reader and heightens the sense of the drama. So he, he, if you think about the third wall in, in, uh, in drama, you know what I mean by, or the fourth wall here, he steps out into the audience and lets you know, you're watching this and I'm letting you know that it's a performance here and I'm horrified by what I'm about to see. Gosh, okay, just so you're, you're, you're ready, okay, here it comes. Right? And they don't have the concept of that here, the fourth wall, but it is functioning in that sort of capacity. Anyway. So there is that, th those three things. Um, now he's going to come to uh, domestic comedy in terms of answerable style. So it's been pretty lofty thus far. The speeches of Satan have been heroic and rhetorical uh, flourishes, such that the, the speeches are rightly famed. Uh, God has spoken in similarly lofty terms. Some have criticized him for sounding a little bit too defensive. I, I don't know. I think Milton does better than, than I could ever do so, or any other writer. So if he fails, it's because it's impossible to do what he's tried to do. Um, now we shift to a different genre or answer, type of answerable style, and it's answerable to the subjects that he is going to present. And what he does present here is, as I say, comedy, domestic comedy. And the two are presented as... Um, the most exemplary aspects of the two are 
perhaps a little overemphasized. So Eve's beauty is repeatedly talked about to the point where, yeah, we get it, Adam. You think that she's beautiful. And we're sort of, okay, he really likes her a lot. And she is constantly praising him for his wisdom. And I think, okay, we got it, Eve. You really like him a lot. And we're sort of chuckling, I think, because it's overpraising, yet without sin. But, that, but it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of like what the way that Uriel just received Satan's praise. You know, I want to do this because to praise God uh, excessively is actually appropriate. So it, it, normally in life, when we overpraise something, we're accused of, of flattery. And of course, Satan was flattering in that case. But, but the reason Uriel doesn't recognize the flattery is because it's entirely appropriate to be lost in joy and in praise of something that's so good. There is no boundary there. It's correct to do so. If you, so if you're an angel and you walked off or wandered away from the, the, the throng of the other cherubim in order to see what God has created, I'm going to praise you for that because that's a good thing to do. It's right to be overstating it and to be joying in that. There's no measure uh, or restraint necessary there. That is a the, the moderation is a consequence of the fall. So Aristotle's in Nicomachean Ethics, he talks about the golden mean between two uh, forms of what we would call sin, he would call uh, vice, I guess. On the one hand, if you do this, it's uh, so courage is the golden mean. You could be foolhardy and throw your life away, or you could be a coward. Both of those are bad things on opposite extremes, but those are forms of sin, and we recognize that the, the way for best behavior in some ways to hit, hit it right, and it's probably between two deficient ways of doing it, being overly courageous, throwing your life away, or being a total coward and not being even willing to stand up. In an unfallen world, there is no such moderation necessary. Moderation, in fact, would be a sin. It's appropriate that uh, Eve thinks Adam the wisest man who ever lived. Well, he's the only one. So, And she's the most beautiful woman who ever lived. Well, she's the only one. So, <laughs> But they both think they're right in what they say. But for us, it's funny. And I think Milton means it to be funny. And we don't expect it of him because thus far he's been so lofty that you don't think that he can be funny. So both of them respond to one another, uh, reacting with praise and reverence and deference. Uh, for our part, we see a little egocentricity developing in, in the two of them, uh, or at least the perception of this. And to some degree, it's anticipating what Satan will do. Eve is so beautiful that he can use that. Satan, because the, the devil uses not your weakness, but your, your greatest strength. He's going to use her beauty against her. And he's going to use Adam's wisdom against him. And there is also a sense even here that although Adam and Eve are, are perfect, um, there's, they, they're developing in their, their status, and their, mankind's becoming more and more numinous, almost uh, heavenly just by, by living. And uh, it's, been into, it's been already referred to that man may eventually become like a god. In the, end, in the end, by the way, mankind, of course, doesn't become a god. It's the reversal of that. God becomes man. Again, it, right, mankind was to exercise dominion, to Edenize the earth, to make it better than it was. There's a sense of progress possible there. But rather than do that, God decides that he is going to humble himself as a man. Ironic in a different sense. He's going to bring about his means by uh, unexpected means. Um, question. But, but, but there's a, there's, so there's a tragic comic element there so the tragedy is almost inherent in the portrait of them and their perfection um, question why does God give woman to man Adam's created first 
before you. Why, why that? Uh, Hesiod, the Greek epic poet, said that it was a punishment. A little har yeah, harsh, eh? It was a but it was a punishment uh, to Prometheus, and then the myth of Pandora uh, ensues. So it was a, it, women were given to men as punishment. I struggle not to laugh. <laughs> yeah, and the, and it can get flipped around, of course. Um, uh, um, what's Milton's view is clearly nothing like that. Um, it's because it's not good for man to be lo By the way, that, that phrase, it's not good, it's the first instance in scripture. God said, it's good, it's good, it's good, good. And then it's not good for man to be alone, but he's created it and he creates everything good. What does this mean exactly? It's a funny old thing. There's no fall, but there's something that's not good about man being alone. Really interesting po place to reflect. God's created it, everything's good, and yet he says, what I've just created is, it, there's a not goodness. Not good is being depraved of something. And deprived, so it's not, not depraved. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> being deprived of something. It's not good, not because it's bad per se, but because there's something missing. It's yes. Missing group of women. Yes. But it's saying something about the nature of goodness then, as a completion and a, as a as a society, and about human nature even. It's not good. Individual or solitude is is not good. There's something of human nature that's we're deprived of if it's only on itself, in and of itself. So the Enlightenment's postulate, this is before the Enlightenment, but the Enlightenment's postulate of human happiness being achieved through autonomy is totally rejected here. You know, I need to get my own goal, my own pleasure, my own goodness. I seek that myself. I need to be a law unto myself. Milton uh, categorically rejects it, that, that very idea. Uh, so what are they then? Well, Adam and Eve are not really, uh, one way is to say that they're the representatives of humanity. I don't think that's exactly right. Um, we've already seen other possibilities, um, Satan and sin, I guess a male figure and a female figure, horrific one. Um, seems to me they are, they're, they're types or stereotypes of men and women. And that's part of the comedy as well, maybe. Remember, Adam and Eve are going to be types of uh, Christ and his church as well. Those are the representatives of mankind, perhaps. Anyway, we will see this portrayed now. It's really one of the things that creating the game makes up. So we, we, we heard Milton's um, satanic reflection on what he is about to see. And then his commentary on this, while he spake, 114, each passion dimmed his face, thrice changed with pale, ire, envy, and despair, which marred his borrowed visage and betrayed him counterfeit, if any eye beheld. For heavenly minds from such distempers foul are ever clear. His... Uh, his heart's upon his, what do we say there? Heart's on his breast. On his sleeve or his breast, yeah. Wearing a heart. He, he can't hide what he's thinking. It's come out there. And he's aware of that fact, and so he covers up very quickly. Whereof he's soon aware, each perturbation smoothed with outward calm, artificer of fraud, and was the first that practiced falsehood under saintly show not the last. Deep malice to conceal, couched with revenge, yet not enough, had practiced to deceive Uriel once warned. So now Uriel, who he has managed to get by, by uh, hypocrisy, and Uriel couldn't see it, but now the change in his appearance of anger and, and envy and so forth 
Uriel has seen that. He's exposed himself. Whose eye pursued him down the way he went, and on the Assyrian mount saw him disfigured, more than could befall a spirit of happy sort. His gestures fierce he, st he marked and sad and mad demeanor. Then alone, as he supposed, all unobserved, unseen. So on he fares, and to the border comes of Eden, where delicious paradise now nearer crowns with her enclosure green, as with a rural mound, the champagne head of a steep wilderness. So Uriel, Uriel spots him, and down Uriel is coming to go get him. <clears throat> I, will, I will come back to that in a second. But uh, uh, note that uh, there's something in mankind, the desire to be praised, that is also in Satan. Again, this is uh, an anticipation of the fall before the fall happens as well or if not an anticipation, a, uh, something that leads us to reflect on the means by which mankind will come down. So the uh, description of Eden that uh, transpires uh, hereafter is a sort of a set piece. It's necessary. It's a necessity of epic poetry, says Horace in his uh, um, recommendations on writing epic poetry. There have to be set pieces that the audience will recognize. And here the description of Eden is that. There's a steep, savage hill, 172. Satan climbs up the hill. Why? Because it's there. Yes, but also because of his overarching ambition. He's going, it's, it's a symbol of his pride. When he does so, he will enter through the one gate that is there on the east side, like the New, the, uh, the new Jerusalem. It's only one gate, whereas in hell there were three gates if you recall, focusing in no direction. That's why he didn't know where to go. Like he's going all right and he has to ask Uriel, where, where is this place? And he tells him, otherwise he would never have found it. Uh, when he does come over and he enters into Eden, we're given three, uh, sent three description, descriptions here. One of a, of a wolf climbing into a fold I am the good shepherd. He talks about the true shepherd and the false shepherd. The, false, the true shepherd will feed the flock and fight the wolf, just like David or the lion. Um, but wolves will climb into the fold, and he is the first wolf climbing into the fold. So the first covenant, when Moses is herding his sheep, he, he sees a burning, unconsumed bush. Um, second analogy here, he, he's like a thief stealing into the night. And uh, so the climbing is a sort of hubris. The third uh, description here, he presents uh, the... Uh, Satan, I forgot to mention this, of course he becomes uh, the toad, but before he's the toad, he's a cormorant on, on the tree. Where is this? Line, uh, so he's a thief, like a rich burger, up he go, flies under the tree. Okay, 194. Thence up he flew, and on the tree of life, the middle tree, and highest there that grew, sat like a cormorant. Yet not true life thereby regained, but sat devising death to them who lived. Nor on the virtue thought of that life-giving plant, but only used for prospect. What well used had been the pledge of immortality. So little knows any but God alone to value right the good before him, but perverts best things to worst abuse or to their meanest use. So even on the midst of the tree of life, which would have been good to him, he doesn't even recognize that it is the tree of life. So there's terrific irony here. 
while seeking to pervert God's ways, Satan just happens to land on the middle of the three trees on the tree of life, which it will, will draw to the reader's mind the, uh, the analogy of the three trees, Christ being nailed to one of them, the tree of death on which the Lord of life brought life. Satan devising death, sitting on the tree of life and incapable of even receiving that he is on the tree of life. So again, the irony, it needs to be read with, with uh, not only the illusions that are there, but also the, the deep and heavy irony of him sitting on the tree of life and only thinking about death. Devising death, perverting it, not understanding it. <laughs> and above all, not understanding that God will use death in order to bring about life and defeat in order to bring about victory and his own humiliation to bring about the glorification his, his, his glorification. So lots of irony, and the irony is probably inherent in the message of the cross itself. <clears throat> so the cormorant uh, sitting on the, on the uh, tree of life there, uh, which is a, uh, which, there's a parallel to this as well, and this is just an aside. In medieval iconography, there's another bird that's often portrayed, that it's a pelican. You ever heard this before? It's a, a pelican. The pelican uh, was thought uh, by, I don't think this is actually true, by the way, but it was thought to, to uh, rip its own breast with its beak, and it would feed its young through the drops of blood that fell from it. So in medieval iconography, you'll see a pelican there that's tearing into its own breast to feed its young. The blood of the pelican being like the blood of the uh, sacrament, and the pelican thereby being a symbol of Christ. But a cormorant is a fishing bird, furthermore, as is a pelican. But the description there, and as I say, it's a pretty set piece. Uh, he, there's ambrosial fruit of vegetable gold, he describes it. Next to life, our, our death, the tree of knowledge grew fast by. Again, Milton's not even going to bother pretending that there's any other outcome than the one that we already know. Knowledge of good bought dear by knowing ill. The, again, the irony. Knowledge of good bought dear by knowing ill. How do we get good? Again, there's the total perversion of this. Everyone's, every, according to Augustine, nobody, and actually Plato for that matter, people do things because they perceive a good in it. Nobody does a bad thing for the sake of the bad. They do it for the sake of what they perceive to be a good to themselves. They can be deceived about that, but everyone desires good things. But here, the, the knowledge of good bought dear by knowing ill. So they sought the goodness of God by doing an evil act, which is an impossibility and also perverted in its logic. But down they go, and see, Satan sees humanity for the first time, 287. Let me pick it up there. Because his first impression is pretty interesting. He sees living creatures new to sight and strange, two of far nobler shapes, erect and tall, godlike erect, with native honor clad in naked majesty seemed lords of all, and worthy seemed, for in their looks divine the image of their glorious maker shone. Truth, wisdom, sanctitude severe and pale, severe but in true filial freedom placed, whence true authority in men, in freedom, there is authority. In obedience, there's freedom. There is there's authority in the willing submission, the freely given obedience that is not demanded. And therefore, true authority is uh, affected. Though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed, for contemplation he in valor formed, 
for softness she and sweet attractive grace. He for God only, she for God in him. Echoing uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. Christ uh, formed for God in Adam and Eve, the, the analogy for that. His fair, large front and eye sublime declared absolute rule and hyacinth locks round from his parted forelock manly hung, clustering but not beneath his shoulders broad. So he got long hair, but not below his shoulders. Like Milton used to wear his hair. Not that he's projecting. She is a veil down to her the slender waist, her unadorned golden tresses wore disheveled, but in wanton ringlets waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection, but required with gentle sway, and by her yielded, by him best received, yielded with coy submission, modest pride, and sweet reluctant amorous delay. Nor those, who, nor those mysterious parts were then concealed, then was not guilty shame, dishonest shame of nature's works, honored dishonorable, sin bred. How have ye troubled all mankind with shows instead, mere shows of seeming pure, and banished from man's life his happiest life, simplicity and spotless innocence? So pass they naked on. <laughs> so the description here of, of the two of them, uh, which is hard for unfallen creatures to receive uh, without censure. Uh, by the mere differentiation, there's a perception on our part of inequality would be the wrong word, of, of uh, diminution of Eve in some way, because we praise and prize intellectual superiority above uh, physical beauty, because we're all secretly uh, Gnostics and prized the intellect above the body. Um, both of them submit to one another and do so with free will. That's important for Milton to establish that. Right at the end, so there's true filial freedom there. Now it's called filial freedom. That's a um, those who are of the same family. Whence, as he says, true authority comes. Reflects a great, I mean, within those ver very few lines, you could, you could talk a great deal about the uh, theology that in, uh, is inherent in that and all the political consequences of this and the social consequences of this, the familial consequences of it whatever we might think of it. Um, I, I don't think we can read these passages now without the, the lens of Victorian ideas intruding upon our thoughts and perverting our reception of it. <laughs> so the idea that men are, you know, have the stiff upper lip and they don't show their feelings uh, and they're intellectually superior and women are to be seen and not heard and uh, to be beautiful but um, but not to be um, demonstrative in any way, to be cosseted up in, you know, some sort of, um, what do you call those things? The corsets. corsets, so their ribs are breaking and they can't breathe and they're fainting. Um, and men can't possibly withstand the view of a woman's ankle, so they gotta cover them up and they gotta even cover the, cover the legs of a piano with a, you ever been in a church, they cover the legs of a piano with some sorts of things? Because it might give you the wrong ideas. That, that looks like an ankle, oh, I can't cope with that. The Victorians, the Victorians are not Puritans. The Victorians are prudes. There's a, the divide, you, some of you have heard me on this before. I amplify it when I do the liter, literary theory. There's a great divide that happens between men and women in the 18th century uh, in the portrait and understanding of the power relations, which has not left us. I can't amplify it here, but uh, I will deal with it if you come and do that course. Uh, History of Literary Theory, Part One, Edmund Burke. We, I talk all about that, uh, the portrait of it. 
Sorry? The sublime and the beautiful. The sublime and the beautiful, correct. Men are sublime, women are beautiful. And there's no, this is not a matter of degree, it's a totally separate, it's a distinction of kind. Totally distinct. Whereas before that, the sublime and the beautiful are degrees. The sublime is the most beautiful, but it's still beautiful. Now they're totally separate experiences and, and they're related to power. We feel something is beautiful when we, we feel our power over it. That's beauty. So like a baby, oh, well, that's a beautiful baby, but it's never a sublime baby. So it's because we feel power over the child. And we feel power over women, men do, because they feel their power, and that's why they think they're beautiful. It's really all about power. You can see what feminism is going to do with that. It's all, you know, it's all about power relations. I think it's seriously problematic. It needs, needs a great deal of uh, reflection. <coughs> um, Anyway, so he, he says, that now, and I want to pause. So Satan, having said this, his first words, 358, oh, hell. <laughs> what do mine eyes with grief behold? Into our room of bliss thus high advanced creatures of other mold, earth born perhaps, not spirits, yet to heavenly spirits bright little inferior, whom my thoughts pursue with wonder and could love. So lively shines in them divine resemblance and such grace, the hand that formed them on their shape hath poured. Ah, little pair, ye little think how nigh your change approaches, when all these delights will vanish and deliver ye to woe. More woe and more your taste is now of joy. Happy, but for so happy, ill-secured long to continue. And this high seat, your heaven, ill-fenced for heaven to keep out such a foe as now is entered. Yet not no purposed foe to you whom I could pity thus forlorn, though I unpity. League with you I seek, and mutual amity so straight, so close that I with you must dwell, and you with me henceforth. My dwelling haply may not please light this fair paradise, your sense, yet such accept your maker's work. He gave it me, which I as freely give. Hell shall unfold to entertain you too, her widest gates and send forth all her kings. There will be room, not like these, numer these narrow limits to receive your numerous offspring, if no better place. Thank him who puts me loath to this revenge on you who wrong me not for him who wronged and should I at your harmless innocence melt, as I do, yet public reason just, honor and empire with revenge enlarged by conquering this new world compels me now to do what else, though damned, I should abhor. So spake the fiend, and with necessity, not at freedom again, not with necessity. He feels compelled to do it. He has to do it. What could compel him? God. No, it's not God doesn't predestine it. He, he's explicitly disavowed that. But there's a sense of necessity. He has no choice anymore. Satan is God's drudge. He's doing his bidding. He does choose evil as his good, but that choice is to some degree not a real choice. The choice to lose your capacity to choose is a funny sort of choice. But so spake the tyrant's plea and excused his devilish deeds. Then from his lofty stand on that high tree, down he alights among the sportful herd of those four-footed kinds himself, now one, now other, as their shape served best as it, so he keeps rep putting himself in the guise of another animal. Why to get nearer to view his prey, and unespied to mark what of their state he more might learn by word or action marked? About them round a lion, now he stalks with fiery glare. Milton picks this up from... Peter, devil roars about like a roaring lion, roams about, then as a tiger, then as a, uh, ultimately he will get close and he will listen to Adam first of men, to first of women Eve, this moving speech, first speech we get from Adam and Eve then, here, but note Milton or Milton Satan excusing his wicked deeds uh, by saying I had no choice. So Milton, on the one hand, uh, 
is saying that Satan is the Lord's drudge. He has to do it. On the other hand, he can't excuse himself for that. This is the tyrant's plea. I had no choice. I had to kill those people. I had to send the tanks out on the, march, the uh, protesters in Tiananmen Square, or I had to shoot into the crowd. I'd, I had no choice. Or I had to crack down on civil liberties because we needed order. The, the, the list could go on and on. There, there's always, and there's always a claim, note even in a tyrant's case, there's a claim of a good that outweighs the evil that's done, which is characteristic. Again, nobody accepts. I want to shoot into this crowd because I want to kill as many of those so-and-sos as I can. You can't say that with, you can't say that coolly. You could do it as a response. They killed us, I'm going to shoot back. But when you vocalize it, it, it is presented as a positive thing. So then the first time Adam speaks, sole partner and sole part of all these joys, dearer thyself than all, needs must the power that made us. For us, this ample world be infinitely good and of his good as liberal and free as infinite that raised us from the dust and placed us here in all this happiness. I mean, that, that itself is a symbol of how gracious God is. Adam has been made from the dust and he rises up erect in the image of God. What a blessing. In all this happiness, who at his hand have nothing merited, nor can perform aught whereof he hath need. He who requires from us no other service than to keep this one, this easy charge of all the trees in paradise that bear delicious fruit, so various, not to taste that only tree of knowledge planted by the tree of life, so near grows death to life, whate'er death is, some dreadful thing, no doubt. For well thou knowest God hath pronounced it death to taste that tree. The only sign of our obedience left among so many signs of power and rule conferred upon us and dominion given over all other creatures that possess earth, air, and sea. Then let us not think hard one easy prohibition who enjoy free leave so large to all things else and choice unlimited of manifold delights. But let us ever praise him and extol his bounty following our delightful task to prune these growing plants and tend these flowers which were it which were it toilsome yet with thee were sweet so a little bit of oh this this might be a laborious laborious task but if i can do it with you this is not so bad to whom thus eve replied o thou for whom and from whom i was formed flesh of thy flesh and without whom am to no end my guide and head what thou hast said is just and right, for we to him indeed all praises owe. And daily thanks, I chiefly who enjoy so far the happier lot, enjoying thee preeminent by so much odds, while thou, like consort to thyself, canst nowhere find. Now this is actually not accurate. She's made in the image of God as well. We don't, don't take this as a theological or an ontological statement. It's a statement of humility on her part. I'm not worthy of you, Adam. And he says, I can do all the work all day long as long as I'm with you. The two are in love, right? So don't take it as a statement of anything other than dramatic purport, uh, purport here. Uh, I chiefly who enjoy so far the happier lot, enjoying the preeminent by so many odd, while thou light consort to thyself canst nowhere find. Well, God said otherwise. She is fit for him. He couldn't find any other one, but he made one. That day I oft remember when from sleep I first awaked and found myself reposed under a shade on flowers, much wondering where and what I was, whence thither brought and how. Not distant far from thence a murmuring sound of waters issued from a cave and spread into a liquid plain then stood unmoved, pure as the expanse of heavens, I thither went with unexperienced thought and laid me down on the green bank to look into the clear, smooth lake that to me seemed another sky. As I bent down to look, just opposite, a shape within the watery gleam appeared, bending to look on me 
I started back. This is it's the an echo of the story of Narcissus. She doesn't fall in the pool, unlike Narcissus. But there's an element of the by invoking it, the vanity, perhaps, of Eve. Yet not not a sinful form, but just an awareness of her. But it started back, but pleased I soon returned. <laughs> of sympathy and love. There I had fixed mine eyes till now, and pined with vain desire, had not a voice thus warned me. What thou seest, what there thou seest, fair creature, is thyself. With thee it came and goes, but follow me, and I will bring thee where no shadow stays thy coming, and thy soft embraces. He whose image thou art, him thou shalt enjoy inseparably thine, to him shalt bear multitudes like thyself, and thence be called mother of human race. What could I do but follow straight, invisibly thus led? So she hears the voice of God that tells her not to look at herself in the water and come with him. Off he goes, till I espied thee, fair indeed and tall, under a platen, yet methought less fair, <laughs> less winning soft, less amiably mild than that smooth watery image. Back I turned. Okay, he's not as pretty as that image I saw. I don't like the look of him. Back I turned. Thou following criedst aloud, return, fair Eve. Whom fliest thou? Whom thou fliest of him thou art, his flesh, his bone, to give thee being I lent out of my side to thee, nearest my heart, substantial life, to have thee by my side henceforth an individual soulless dear. Part of my soul I seek thee, and thee claim my other half. With that thy gentle hand seized mine, I yielded, and from that time see how beauty is excelled by manly grace and wisdom, which alone is truly fair. But it's an interesting, the encounter is, he's like, wow, and she is, yuck. <laughs> Needs a little persuasion. Not quite as attractive as that thing that I saw in the water <coughs> as a mirror. Again, the, the, the domestic, it's, I think it's lightly done and quite well done. Uh, I think the touches throughout this are rather well done by Milton. And we will witness conjugal uh, affection uh, in the verses that fo follow. When I say conjugal affection, there is, there is sex in Milton. Uh, Milton wants to, and he portrays it, again, quite elegantly, to combat the idea that sin uh, originated in the sexual act, which some of the church fathers thought probably influenced by uh, their Gnostic dualism. The idea that the body is an evil and the soul is a spiritual good embodied in it, and so the bodily, anything bodily partakes of sin. And Milton is very clear that that is not the case, and he wants to be clear by pre presenting Adam and Eve in this way. So there's an element of, yes, they're different, and yes, there's a little bit of uh, and a little bit of wow, but there's a, a, a suitability there, and he presents, so that there's genuine difference, but also genuine uh, appropriateness, and, and the, the basis for love. God is also not like us, and we love God, and he loves us, though we're not like him. So anyway. Um, I'll pick it up next class with the uh, uh, a talk about maybe a few more things, book four, but then we'll move on to book five and the war in heaven and book six. So we're going to start to pick it up a little bit. Okay, I'll see you then.